So thank you very much for coming to uh, uh, the first public presentation here at our new building of the Internet Archive. So thank you very much for coming. Um, the Internet Archive, as a, as a library, um, has, has bought this building and we've been working to make it work as a, um, as a performance space and our offices and a scanning center. Um, so as you leave, if you go around the building, you can see books being scanned and microfilm being scanned, and I highly recommend it. Um, and it's been, I think, a tribute to San Francisco to have them, the planning department, which isn't necessarily known for big, bold steps, uh, to uh, uh, take a church and say, yes, a, a library is a wonderful thing to have in this place. We just crossed one million, scanning one million books and making them publicly available. And we really need something like ZigZag, uh, Ted Nelson's new idea, to help try to make, make sense of it and help the next generation make uh, good use of a million online books. This is the first, um, and we hope to be a long series of Internet Archive Presents. And I think of no better way than to have Ted Nelson um, be the inaugural address um, launching his autobiography. Um, I don't think I need to really introduce him, uh, but I'm really very proud to work with Ted Nelson in many different ways. So if I could please introduce Ted Nelson. Before I start, I'd like to thank Brewster Kale, Mary Austin, the Internet Archive, my sweet partner, Malene Malicote, and the Engelbarts, who are here tonight. But I'll stop there because if, if I go on thanking people, that'll take all the time. forethought. I am writing my history because they say that history is written by winners, and I still intend to win. <laughs> this book is coming out just 50 years after I had my main ideas in the computer field. The anniversary is an accident. I've tried to tell the story before, but it's taken till now to clarify and package it reasonably. Everybody wants to tell their story. I have special reasons. I have a unique place in history, and I want to claim it. Indeed, I want it as a vaulting pole, a lever still to move the world. I also want to clear the air, substituting the true story for myth and misunderstandings about my life and work. This is not a modest book. Modesty is for those who are after the Nobel and that chance, if any, is long past. This is what I want known long after. Like Marco Polo and Tesla in their autobiographies, I am crazed for people to know my real story. What the hell gave me the background and temerity to think I could design the documents of the future and indeed conjure a complete computer world on my own and with no technical credentials? when no one else in the world even imagined those things? And why do I still stand against thousands of experts who want to impose their own worlds on humanity? And why do I think I know the true generalization of documents and the true generalization of structure when they don't? That's what this book is about. How I came to the visions, attitudes, and initiatives which have driven me for the last 50 years and drive me still to keep trying though at first I haven't succeeded. This is not the autobiography I wanted to write, languorous, loving, literary, full of family and friends, atmosphere and philosophy, sparkle and sunsets, what the times were like, the powerful emotions we all faced. This is not that. This is far more urgent, a story about attitudes and designs, what I knew and thought about 
and designed and why as I stumbled and clawed and thought my way through the developing computer world of these last 50 years. I'm a controversial figure, which means that those who know my name either love me or hate me, mostly the latter. <laughs> Most seem to regard me as a raving, ignorant, unconscious, delusional dreamer who was strangely and accidentally right about a remarkable variety of things. I was never ignorant, and there was no accident. I knew 10 times more 50 years ago when I started in computers than most people think I know now. <laughs> I considered myself a philosopher and a filmmaker, and what I knew about was media and presentation and design, the nature of writing and literature, the processes of technical analysis and idea manipulation, and the human heart. I also knew about projects and why one dares follow the inner urgings of a project going where its nature wants to go. I saw in 1960 how all these matters would have to transpose to the interactive computer screen. And I have been dealing with the consequences, including both the politics and the technicalities, straight on through since then. <clears throat> For five years, I designed documents and interfaces for the interactive computer screen without ever seeing an interactive computer screen. But I understood perfectly well what it would be like, imagining its performances and ramifications probably better than anyone else. Item, for five years I worked on interactive text systems without knowing that anyone else in the world imagined such things. Item, for eight years I worked on methods for ray tracing and image synthesis without knowing anyone else imagined such things. Now the film industry revolves around them. For 14 years, I believe I was the only person in the world who imagined a world of personal computing as a hobby, everyday activity, and art form, all of which I presented in my book Computer Lib in 1974, months ahead of the first personal computer kit, which started the gold rush. Item, for nearly 20 years, until I convinced five colleagues, I believe I was the only person in the world who envisioned millions of online documents, let alone online documents being read on millions of screens by millions of users from millions of servers and publishable by anyone. Not only did no one else imagine it, I could not make them imagine it, though I lectured and exhorted constantly. You might think this would give me a reputation for foresight, but many consider me a crank because I haven't gotten on any of the bandwagons, Microsoft, Apple, Linux, or the World Wide Web. Why have I not joined any of these parades? Because they're all alike, heresy. And I have always had an alternative. I don't like their designs, what you see around you, and I still intend to get my designs running so you can at last have a real choice. Unfortunately, most people don't realize the computer world has been designed, so that's an uphill battle. I believe my standing designs for a real alternative computer world, complete, clear, and sweeping, are better, deeper, and simpler than what most people have to face now every morning. The myth of technology. The world is totally confused. Everyone uses the word technology for packages and conventions, like email, Windows, Facebook, the World Wide Web. These all use technologies, but are themselves just collections of design, design decisions somebody made without asking you. I see humanity as unknowing prisoners in systems of invisible walls, specific conventions created by hidden techies sometimes long ago and never questioned since by anybody. I'm certain my designs in part or whole, as well as the story told here, will someday vindicate me. What a pisser to have to seek vindication at the age of 73. But I can't wait till I'm dead to tell, I'm, to tell a story, and I can't wait till I'm dead to make the software work. I want to implement these designs now, while they can still be done right with my own detailing, and reduce people's computer misery and quadruple the usability of computer documents. I want to improve the world that is. This is a multi-threaded story. I wish I could tell it in a decent electronic document, a Xanadu document of parallel pages with visible connections. To wit, 
that. How this document ought to look when it opens. A proper parallel hypertext in a possible opening view with visible transclusions, links not shown. So this is what you would see on the screen, not single pages with invisible jumps. Unfortunately, we have still not got decent documents working and deployed. Part of the problem is that people don't understand why they need parallelism, let alone transclusion and multi-way links. Trapped here on paper, I am simulating this parallelism clumsily. I'm using indentations and headings to thread the different stories, for example. Get that thing off there. Xanadu story, phantasm story, personal system, synonym story, and zigzag story. All of those being indented headings. If you have no technical interest, you can read the main story, the personal narrative, by reading only the parts that start at the left margin and ignoring the indented parts. The indented stories above happen to be crucial. Among the many indented headings, the particular five above happen to refer to principal initiatives by which I hope to achieve a financial foothold, creative resources, and independence. The first three of these ideas occurred to me in 1960 and 61. There was no telling in the early 1960s which would bring money first. I may not have thought of the fourth until 1964 and the last not until 1983. All are valid, though no one has ever known it but I. And now these first four ideas have become four different vast industries. But in fact, none of them brought anybody money for at least 16 years after I thought of them. Because there was no way to know which of these ideas would catch on first, I kept on with all of them. They took decades longer than I expected, and I was not on those trains when they pulled out. If I had succeeded in patenting the first two, as I tried to, the patents would have expired by the time these things were commercial. But the most important problem I still face is to give the world decent electronic documents. I do not embrace the World Wide Web, though many think it was my idea. My idea was better. <laughs> Most people imagine that the web is a wonder of technology, whereas I see it as a political setback by a dorky package. As stated above, the web is not technology, it's packaging and conventions. To me, the World Wide Web is an unfortunate presence which must be dealt with like the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> it's all right for shop windows, but not for the precious documents of mankind, which it smashes into sequence, hierarchy, rectangularity, fixed views, huge wasted screen space, and locked lines of text, usually too wide and in faint, unreadable sans serif. The web offers no way to underline, no way to make marginal notes, let alone publish them. No way to make visible links between the documents and other profound documents I won't get into, uh, profound defects I won't get into yet. And it cannot be fixed. The alternative is still possible and simpler. Division Street era, 1937 to 43, chapter one. My family. Our apartment in Chicago had wooden back stairs outside like many Chicago buildings, but in front it was a regular stone-fronted apartment building. The living room, we called it the front room. I remember as sunny though it faced north so the sun could not have shone in directly. My grandmother always wanted a north light for her drawing and painting. It was important that she was an artist. I probably remember it as sunny because I was happy there. I remember how beautiful my grandmother looked in that light, sometimes at her easel, sometimes combing her long blonde hair. We lived, Jean and Pop and I, in Chicago at 37 East Division Street, a short walk from the beach of Lake Michigan. Frequently, they took me to museums and the aquarium, to the park and to the beach. We saw movies at a wondrous palatial theater, and we often went to a wonderful Chinese restaurant. I had been left at six months' age with my grandmother and grandfather and named after him. These were entirely the right decisions. I was Theodore Holmes second, said a membership certificate on the wall. Jean and Theodore Holm, I'm calling him Pop, were an elegant couple. She generally wore high heels and a veil in colder weather furs. 
He was dignified, warm and thoughtful, and wore a fedora. Both spoke with what people mistook for English accents, but she was from Minnesota. In those days, many Americans spoke in a more English fashion, and he was from Norway, though no one could tell. They spoke elegant, elegantly and eloquently with wonderful words. And here's a picture of them. Gene and Theodore Holm. <clears throat> Possibly when they were married. My family was very cultured and loving. Ours was a home of culture. We were members of the Art Institute of Chicago. Actually, I in my crib was the member. When my grandmother went to buy a membership at the museum for the family, the person at the desk suggested getting the membership in the name of the youngest member of the family, and I, the newborn, was it. So said the certificate on the wall, the life membership in the Art Institute of Theodore Holmes II. Leonardo, Shakespeare, Shaw were our household gods. Shakespearean quotes were bandied about frequently. There were family tales of contacts with Gurdjieff and Tagore, and memories of a date, debate Jean had with Emma Goldman. By debate, I assume that what happened was that Jean asked a question at a lecture by Goldman, and then there was some follow-on banter between them. I bet I could even reconstruct it plausibly, but that is another story. I had four main grown-ups. I lived with Jean and Pop in Chicago. Jean's parents, my great-grandparents Blanche and Edmund, were also present in spirit, though they lived far away in Brooklyn, but they would come to Chicago at Christmas, and we would spend the summer with them at our farm. Blanche, my great-grandmother, Blanche, my great-grandmother, reviewed plays for the women's clubs of Brooklyn, unimaginable today. Deeply affectionate, she ghost-wrote my first autobiography when I was one <coughs> and read me numerous books when I was little. Edmund Gale Jewett, Blanche's third husband, was not actually my great-grandfather. She had been twice widowed before marrying Edmund, but we called him my great-grandfather out of courtesy and love. And here he is with his workman, why is there? With his workman <clears throat> at the Lane Jewett Dry Kiln Company, circa 1908. Edmund was a science teacher, very reserved with a white beard. He had invented the fundamental method of lumber drying, now in use, but the big lumber companies had stolen his invention and he got nothing for it. The 1920 edition of his science book, still very good, is available for download now, copyrighted by Google. Edmund was to teach me about evolution, astronomy, his great love, physics, algebra, but he also wrote beautiful poetry. One of his poems about evolution, written in the 30s, is still precisely accurate within today's knowledge. My four grown-ups all treated me with great love and respect. In an early, hazy memory, I recall the four of us, Jean and Pop, Blanche and Edmund, in the lower cabin at the farm, perhaps on a summer evening. When I would speak, they would all fall silent. By the way they listened, they told me that I was very clear-minded, that my thoughts were special, and that I expressed them very well. That is how I first learned who I was. Many children fantasize that their real parents are faraway glamorous people. For me, this was actually true. Like Harry Potter, I had magical parents who were not present. And like Harry Potter, I have been greatly punished for it, but that is another story. My parents were young actors who needed a divorce almost immediately they were married, but my grandfather made them stay married until I was born so I would be, quote, legitimate. Away went my parents to their separate remarkable destinies, but each would visit separately a few times a year. Jean and Pop already had a rich history. On the eve of World War I, she headed to Europe to document the coming war with her drawings, buying a ticket on the Lusitania. A friend, the great photographer Arnold Genta, saved her, but that is another story. After the 1929 crash, Pop was offered a grand job. He quit the one he had, then the grand job offer was withdrawn, and there he was jobless in the Jip Depression, but that is another story. And they had friends among the moderately famous of those days. 
but that is another story. My school, the Bateman School, was in the old McCormick Mansion not far away. I hated it. I didn't hate the teachers or Mrs. Bateman as principal. I hated the institution, and I remember wanting to burn the school down at the age of four or five, but that is another story. <laughs> However it may seem to you, I did not think I was having a privileged childhood. There was so much I could not have, and there was so much I did not like, especially school. And here's a nice picture of that. The title is Cynical and Out Front. The author, four, leads kindergartners debouching the school vehicle circa April 1941. <clears throat> I do remember the day I learned to read. I knew the alphabet, of course, and we had been learning to spell words, but it had never been all put together for us, and I had not been pressured on the matter. On this day, Miss Ferlet, my lovely first grade teacher, handed each of us a pamphlet with a different story. They were photo offset in dark blue, as I recall. Now the words were in a row, and I saw how they were all put together, and I read the story, and the excitement filled me. Miss Follette was very pleased when I asked for another. She was especially pleased when I asked for a third. <coughs> Defining moments, flowers by wire, Data structure, circa 1942. I was five. Jean, my grandmother, often took me to flower shops in Chicago. Each flower shop had a sign outside with a picture of the Greek god Mercury and the words, flowers by wire. How did they get the flowers down the wire? <laughs> I asked the flower man how flowers by wire worked. He said, oh, you wouldn't understand. The flower salesman wouldn't tell me, so I tried to figure out myself how they sent flowers by wire. I thought about it and thought about it. It was a hard problem. Would they start with the stems first or the petals? <laughs> and what about the aroma? I knew, obviously, that you could send a voice by wire. Evidently, flowers could somehow be sent as well. I understood how phone calls went through the wire. There was something you talked into. I didn't yet know that it was called a microphone that translated the speech into some sort of event, I didn't know the term signal, that went all the way to the other end, and there was something else I didn't know was called a speaker, that translated the event back into sound. So I had a correct, if approximate, mental picture of telephony. But how would it work with flowers? You would have to have some kind of device at each end, just as the telephone call had a device at each end. I figured that the device at the starting end must take the flower apart, probably by grinding off a little at a time, and converting that into a signal which went down the wire, and then grinding till the whole flower was transmitted. And then at the other end, there would be a device that reconstituted the flower fragments from the signals, and perhaps extruded the flowers like spaghetti. But would they start with the stems first or the petals, and what about the aroma? These were difficult issues but I felt I had a handle on the basics. Note from the present. I believe these were my first deliberations about data structure and that the analysis was rather good considering the information I had. In fact, that's how many systems of scanning and transmission work today, but not for flowers. If you had told me the real answer, how do they send flowers by wire, someone at the first flower shop telephones the second flower shop and asks the person at the second flower shop to deliver a bouquet to a specific address, I would have been outraged that the flower man withheld such a simple, stupid fact. Still, it was a thinking and learning experience. Defining moments, my hand in the water, circa 1942 or three. I trailed my hand in the water as my grandfather rowed. My grandmother was in the front of the boat wearing high heels as always. I was four or five and this was spring 1943 at the latest. We were still in Chicago. Fuzzy shapes passed underneath. I studied the water's crystal softness the water was opening around my fingers, gently passing around them, 
then closing again behind. I consider the different places in the water and the connections between them, the places that at one instant were next to each other, then separated as my fingers passed. They rejoined, but no longer in the same way. How is it, I wondered, that every instant's arrangement in the water and the world can be so much the same as just before and yet so different? How could even the best words express this complexity? How could even the best words express what systems of relationships were the same and different? And how many relationships were there? I could not have said relationships or systems then, let alone particles or manifolds or higher level commonalities, but those were my exact concerns. My questions and confusions were always exact and fine distinctions concerned me greatly. They still do. In this book, I will try to say exactly what I was thinking at different times, exactly that is in my, in my vocabulary of now. And how, you might ask, do I remember those floating, swirling thoughts over 60 years ago. Because these are matters I've thought about ever since in thousands of different ways. And I reconnect them even now with that early moment of floating crystalline study, rattle of oarlocks, sun twinkle on the water, my grandmother clearing her throat, the thump of oars, my grandfather's earnestness, all with me as I write in the eternal now and then. Xanadu story, connection to the original one. That religious experience, the moment of my hand in the water is with me always. Always I see the profusion of relationships, of connections, of ideas, of possibilities. As a great net across the world, across every subject, across everything. All my philosophical thoughts since then derive from that insight in the rowboat or perhaps some fundamental pattern in mind that first projected into the water some strip of mental film projecting outward from my inner center from which that insight came. The insight was sound. Profuse connection is the whole problem of abstraction, perception, and thought. Profuse connection is the whole problem of expression, of saying anything. It is the problem of writing. It is the problem of seeing. We see and imagine so much more than we can express. Trying to communicate ideas requires selection from this vast, ever-expanding net. Writing on paper is a hopeless reduction as it means throwing out most of the connections, telling the reader only the smallest part in one particular sequence. And this is what I've hoped to fix, or at least improve, through most of my life, giving the world a greater and better way to express thoughts and ideas. And that is what this book is about. This book is about the story of my life and thoughts and of connections. And it is about the connections all amongst life and thought and how I have fought to bring, it about, bring about a better world of thought and its representation. Not 1959, resolve, not narrow down. Here is what they said as graduation approached. It's time to narrow down, Ted. I didn't think so. My strength was in not narrowing down, in doing something new and different every time. And here were my central talents, which I'd come to know at Swarthmore. I believed I could analyze anything, show anything, and design anything. And I could innovate, imagining what no one else could, and, bringing that, and bring that new thing forth through projects of new shapes. But what? What should I analyze, show, design, and innovate about? There was no determinate answer. I was good at a lot of things, but not a great talent at any one, except that my mind was very good. My uniqueness was in the combination of numerous abilities and in my ability to see the big picture quickly. I was a very clever fellow accustomed to picking up new technicalities as required, but I preferred to delegate technical details once I had decided them. I had had a taste of creative control and knew that I could not be an idea man on someone else's projects. Deciding the details and finishing touches was what life was all about. I knew this would make it harder, but what the hell? I was Ted Nelson. 
I would not narrow down. That would be giving up and giving in. Cocteau, Wharf, Bucky. I had very few living role models. I applauded my parents' great success, but I intended some much grander career like various great names in history. I felt I was off to a flying start. But at what? I was a writer and designer and showman. I saw myself be becoming perhaps a showman intellectual like one of my heroes, Jean Cocteau. A theoretical explorer in some new area like my hero, Benjamin Lee Whorf, an academic outlier. He was in the insurance business who was nevertheless respected in academia and created a field of his own. Like my boyhood hero, Buckminster Fuller, a quote, designer and thinker. Perhaps I could create a field of my own like Whorf and Bucky. Egotistical, you say? Of course. But I was going to bet my life on it. Still a chance to make a movie, 1959. My grades were fairly poor. I had gone for breadth, not depth, and I thought it was my own business to judge my achievement, not anybody else's. No one would care about my college grades in the afterlife of the so-called real world. What mattered to me was studying what I chose to the degree I chose and pursuing the excitement of new ideas and projects. So because of my slackness with regard to grades and not having done nearly enough reading, I was worried about graduating. However, something came up that was even more important than graduating. Late in the year, I realized I still have a chance to make my first movie. I still have that $700 appropriation that Tony and I got. I can make that movie. Tony would have wanted me to. He had died abruptly the fall before. Exams were coming, but I figured I could squeak by. This was far more important, a full-on chance to make a movie by myself. I knew other media moderately well. This would tell me whether I had any ability at filmmaking. There was no time to write a script, and sinking the sound would be an enormous problem. So I made the whimsical decision to have the actors just say, parp, parp, and postpone writing the dialogue. I would write the script later on the basis of the film as shot and sink it as best possible to the parping. <laughs> the parping would look like Huckleberry Hound where the characters just moved their jaws vaguely to the script. It would of course look stupid, but I thought it would be funny as well. <laughs> it turns out most people can't stand this. They cannot accept such a movie as a genre like Huckleberry Hound or Fumetti. They can't imagine it as a foreign movie shot in Parpland. It hits a cognitive wall. I bet if some famous person told them it was okay or clever, everybody would flip their perception and enjoy it. As the lead, I chose my friend Jody Hudson, who had a very expressive poker face like Buster Keaton, showing a lot of emotion with minute variations of expression. I didn't plan, I just began. I would have to make up the movie as I went along. I would shoot whatever Jody, whenever Jody and I were both available and grab other actors and sets as best I could. I had a story vaguely in mind, but I started with a classroom scene somewhere in the middle of the story. This was because it involved a large cast and had to be shot in an empty classroom, and so it had to be done on a weekend. Defining moments, the first slocum shoot. I rounded up actors at Sunday lunch, whoever could spare an hour or two. I just went around the tables and asked who wanted to be in the movie. We went to a basement classroom in Trotter Hall. I arranged the actors according to when they would have to leave. I would shoot the full room shots first, then the kids in the front row could leave as I narrowed down to the back rows where I put the actors who could stay longer. So it had to be shot out of order and there were two sequences to keep in mind, the sequence of the intended final story and the sequence of who had to leave when, which governed the order of its shooting. I made up the story as I went along, starting with this basic idea. The hero in a boring class makes eyes at a girl in the front row and his chair falls over. Fleshed out as I shot it, it went like this. The lonely hero, Slocum Furlow, played by Jody, sits doodling at the back of a classroom. The class is an idiotic mix of philosophy, sociology, and nonsense. As the discussion drones on meaninglessly, Slocum catches the eye of a girl in the front row, played by Carolyn Shields. They make eyes at each other. He leans further and further back in his chair till he falls over very, very gradually. Everyone leaves, the girl is gone. 
The result of that shoot was electrifying. Defining moments, somebody knew. Something happened to me as I shot that first film of my film, that first scene of my film, that afternoon in Trotter Hall. My absent-mindedness and scatter-mindedness disappeared. I figured out everything in the moment and made up the story as I went along, keeping track with surprising clarity of what was done and what was not. I had never been so clear-minded. I still had to keep making notes on the back of my hand, but I was awake and alive in a new way. As never before, I kept all parts of the problem in my mind, working very fast. I will never forget the clarity and the excitement of making up that scene as I fought the clock, positioned and directed the actors, took the shots, dismissed the actors, and narrowed down to only Slocum. I became a different person. I had suddenly become the person I always wanted to be. And I've always wanted to be that person again. Defining moments. The ceiling flies away. Slocum rushes May 1959. I kept shooting the epiphany of Slocum furlough, a scene every two or three days, but it took a week for the first roles to be developed. I called in some friends to look at what I had shot. I didn't realize that most people can't see a scene out of order and understand it in their mind. Here is what they saw. Strange repeated shots of people lounging around and saying silently, parp, parp. <laughs> and repeated shots of Jody falling down in his chair. Even though I explained the scene to them before running the projector, they were utterly mystified. They didn't know. But for me, the roof flew off the building. I, I heard a roaring wind. My destiny had found me. What I saw was the finished scene as it would be. The scene was atmospheric. It developed characters. It had a plot. It was moderately subtle. It was rather funny. And it was warm, more like a foreign than an American film, like the films of Pagnol or Satyajit Ray. It was far better than I had imagined it could be, far better than I had remotely hoped. I will now show you the finished scene. As I saw it in my mind and later finished it. be said about the spirit of an age is manifest among we can only see from the evidence the exact state of society certainly has a bearing which is really little more to than to say that the whole literary movement is at least an outgrowth more like a on the other hand it would be well to consider that neither the relative nor the absolute viewpoint gives us meat enough for the actual critical discussion. In the second place, there is clearly doubt that any advocate of the alternative stand could plausibly advance the reciprocal view without entanglement in that group of problems <coughs> which we have spent the last several weeks on. Unless we can suspend any temporary disbelief in order to examine, which the materialistic, not to say surreptitious, attempt would definitely. In any case, there is hardly doubt that under the circumstances, various qualifications <coughs> have. Hence, any of the heretofore intangible factors may conceivably stand forward. Mm. or backward. Maybe I'd better go over that point again. <clears throat> there is clearly, as we have seen, doubt that the alternative stand is completely, clearly without advocate. Yes? Uh, Dr. Malt, I'm just throwing this out. <laughs> but do you attribute the resurgence, or at least certain, that is, not specific factors as more or less contributory, uh, however the influence or reaction might be thought, or <laughs> tentatively, wherever they appear, if suddenly circumstances we feel That's that... That's ridiculous. <laughs> How can you possibly say that any of the problems have anything to do with it? This is 
no matter of metaphysics. This is life itself. I don't want to flout my religion in your faces, but unless it is realized that there is more in the universe than meets the eye, I think it's a lot of poo. Well, that's a good start. But don't you think you might be leaving something out? That is, there might be more to it. I don't see what you mean. Well, regarding the whole thing as a framework of relations constituting the universe of discourse, wouldn't you say, surely some, if not all? Well, Dr. Malt, I don't want to seem insufferable. Ever since the fall from the state of nature, that is, if you believe in the fall, or the state of nature. Well, there is a state of nature. That is, nature exists. Uh, watch out for that wall. But what makes it relevant? How do we know anything? me such pleasure to hear you laughing. <laughs> the question was not whether I could learn to make films. I already knew. I was a natural. This was what I'd been put on earth to do, partly to make movies and partly to be again that person I was when I was shooting. This was no longer about being best at anything. This was about my heart, which I had found. The only problem was I wanted to be an intellectual, too. Chapter 7. The Epiphany of Ted Nelson. In that first year of Harvard, at Harvard, 1961, I took a computer course and my world exploded. What would Freed Bales have said, 1960? Freed Bales, he didn't use the Robert socially, was a most amiable and pleasant psychologist in my Sockrell department. His long-term research included a gut course that could be taken any number of times by undergraduates and grad students alike, in which they argued about interpersonal issues at any level of inanity they chose. Meanwhile, behind one-way glass, Bales' research assistants were taking down and coding everything that happened. Bales made the most trenchant remark on computers I ever heard. Quote, the computer is the greatest projective system ever created, Bales said to me, meaning that anyone looking at the computer would think they were, seeking, were seeing reality, but would see something projected from their own mind. For 50 years since then, I have marveled at how everyone projects onto the computer their own issues and concerns and personality. I did too. Defining moments, a wild surmise. Then I felt like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. I was the first, but John Keats, I was the first person on earth to know what I'm about to tell you, except with one exception. I believe I thought of everything here in the fall of 1960, though some of it may have been in 1961, the second semester of that school year. I believe this can all be confirmed from my detailed notes of those days, though they will likely be telegraphic summaries and proposed articles to write. No one told me or suggested these ideas. I didn't read them, and there was no one to confirm them with. A few conversations with computer scientists on campus made it clear they had other obsessions. But I didn't need any confirmation. From all my background and daring in media and ideas and initiatives in many directions, I simply knew. I saw the vastness of what I was facing and the certainty of a new world to come. 
a few words, a few pictures of people at computer screens, and the understanding that computer prices would fall. These gave me all I needed to know, a crystal seed from which to conjure a whole universe, and a good one. The only issue was how to shape the real word, world toward that good, because it could all go wrong in so many ways. Point. They had been lying. The public had been told that computers were mathematical, that they were engineering tools. This misstated things completely. The computer was an all-purpose machine. Others knew that, of course, but it wasn't widely stated, and could be whatever it was programmed to be. It had no nature. It could only masquerade. The computer could become only whatever imaginary structure people imposed on it, onto which they would project their own personalities and concerns. Therein lay the glory and the difficulty. The computer could handle text. Alphabetical characters fit into the same memory slots as the numbers. Instead of adding and subtracting them, you could move them around. Text could, can be stored. Text could be printed. Text could be shown on screens. So far, that was only done for technical purposes, but obviously there was no limitation on what text would be shown and how it might behave. The computer did not contain knowledge. Instead, it had to be programmed to simulate some unified arrangement of data. This data had to be represented by a lot of pieces of information placed in a lot of memory locations, suitably organized, probed, and updated. This collection of factoids could be made to appear as a unified body of information, but this too was a masquerade. The term database did not yet exist. The editorial problems for a collection of data, keeping it updated and consistent, were just like the editorial problems of a research paper, just more formalized and pretending to more rigor. There was no magic to this simulation of knowledge. It just took diligence and a lot of work and a lot of choices about conventions and standards and consistency and authentication. The implicit choices made all over the paper world by librarians, office supervisors, clerks, everybody, had to be made explicit and locked into software. Point. They were electric trains. This meant personal computing. Insight. Computers were electric trains. Why did guys like electric trains? Because you could make them do things, plan them and build them and watch them go around. The computer aroused all the same masculine desires to control and to putter. I wanted a computer. That told me every guy would want one. The one I lusted for at the time was called the ANUYK-1, was highly reliable and was narrow enough to be lowered into a submarine through its hatch and cost $75,000. But obviously, the price was going to come way down. And if every guy wanted one, that meant there would be a huge personal computer industry when they got cheap enough, of course. Point. The future of mankind was at the computer screen. So much of modern life was about paper and its manipulations, but it wasn't the paper that mattered, it was what was on the paper, and that could be turned to data. It was obvious to me that for all clerical purposes and for all information, the interactive computer would become the workplace of the future. Point, eliminating paper. It likewise seemed obvious to me that paper would be completely replaced, but offices were hardly interesting to me back then. What mattered to me was how paperlessness could contribute to the creativity the understandings, the intellectual excitement of human life. Point, magic pictures to command. Diagrams, maps, history, every subject and the connections between subjects could all interact on our interactive screens. The problem was working out the rules. Everyone should be able to contribute to a great world of interconnection, but not to wreck it. How could this be set up? Unlosability. Oh, I'll stop there. This chapter goes on and on. <laughs> Longest chapter in the book by far. The Sword in the Stone. In the legend, young King Arthur comes upon a sword handle sticking out of a stone. He pulls it out because it is his destiny. It is, des it is his destined instrument. The rest follows. The sword is called Excalibur. I saw these discoveries, discoveries as my Excalibur, beyond calibration, with which I would carve the future. 
and with which I would slay the dragons of evil, shallowness, conventionality, pomposity, and smugness. Resolve, all conflicts gone. I had been waiting for a sign. I'd been waiting for I knew not what, but somehow I had expected a revelation. I had expected some life mission to reveal itself to me, though I was expecting something more along the lines of an intellectual discovery. What now was all this? Fate was daring me to do something entirely different, something unheard of, something very important that only I understood and only I could do. Where was that unique intellectual life whose revelation I had been awaiting? But then, wasn't this an intellectual discovery? Oh my God, this was it. This was everything I was searching for. I knew a handle sticking out of a stone when I saw one. I thought earlier there would be a great philosophical revelation or some great film to make or that I could somehow fix education. This could be all these things and more. All my conflicts of long-term goals were resolved. I'd felt a conflict between being an idealist and making money, not an uncommon conflict for a young man. No more. This would make the world a far better place and make me tons of money on the way. Here was a single path to everything I believed in and wanted. What more worthy goal could a brash young man choose than to rebuild civilization anew? <laughs> I figured that programming the system, deploying it, and revolutionizing the world would take about two years. I was impatient to get done with that, then I could get back to movie making and I would be able to finance my movies myself without having to deal with backers. <laughs> there has never been any other plan. I wanted to be the Gutenberg of this new medium that I, only I imagined, and the Griffith and the Disney. Little did I know that Gutenberg had gone bankrupt. So, with 50 years yet to go, I'll stop reading there, but I'll show you one more thing. People seem to think that this Xanadu design of mine, which I've been working on for 50 years and which was perfected with Roger Gregory and others in 1979, is somehow mythical, some delusion, some inane misunderstanding of technical possibilities. Not at all. All the details are given in the appendix of the book. But the main point is we, we actually have a fully functional version right now. When I say fully functional, I mean all the parts are working but not very well integrated. So the, in, the interface ain't so great, but I will show it to you now. Okay, this is Xanadu space. We are looking at two pages of a compound hypertext. Now, I showed you earlier, beginning of this book, the notion of a parallel hypertext. Eh. With multiple pages connected sideways. There. So this is my model of hypertext. This is what you should see. You should be able to magnify and zoom in on any of these or click on the links and transclusions and emphasize those. This is the opposite of the notion of so-called WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get, which is a euphemism for simulating paper. Why, I ask, would anyone simulate paper on a computer screen? That to me is like tearing the wings off a 747 and flying it on the highway as a bus. <laughs> the earliest horseless car carriages had a socket for a whip. This gave reassurance. Similarly, people have told me, well, of course you need to simulate paper so that people will be reassured. Excuse me. The paperless office is possible, but not if you simulate paper. 
Not only that, but the paper they simulate is paper under glass. You can't fold it, staple it, or mutilate it. You can't use sticky notes, you can't write on it, no marginal notes. No, they're simulated, I, can, I compare it to canopic jars in ancient Egypt. In the canopic jars, they would, they would put your liver and your brains in order to, in, in order to uh, preserve them for posterity, but uh, it's like makeup on a corpse. He may look good, but he won't dance again. <laughs> and the whole point is to be able to use and see and understand information better and better. Writing and documents have, for millennia, evolved to present information in various, inform various ways and styles. We must open up to the real possibilities of interactive documents and not paper under glass. But they made an unholy al alliance. For example, I believe that Adobe made an unholy an alliance with the type foundries. Why can't you just thicken the serifs a little bit? Answer, because the, the type foundries wanted to sell you these different fonts they sell. Why do we have these inane point sizes that were established in the 18th century? Because it's part of the package that the type foundries sell. We need to get away from this. Okay, so anyway, this is a simple visualization of the kind of parallel document I advocate, and here it actually is in the flesh. Yep. So we're looking here at two parallel pages. Hello? We're looking at two parallel pages. The one with the larger type is called the, uh, the current page, and the one beside it with the smaller type is the companion page. This is, as I said, a prototype, and so it, it, these things are not perfectly marked. We are looking at a transclusion. We'll get back to that. But meanwhile, let's, let's zoom forward, I mean, truck forward, and see what kind of a world we're in. We're actually in a hypertext of some 11 pages, and you see the various visible connections which we're flying through. Those are the, the bluish, bluish ones are the, tra are the links, and the red ones are the transclusions. The transclusions show better. What's a transclusion? The same material visibly in two places. So this particular demo was set up to emphasize <clears throat> one idea. People say to me, how can you deal with thousands of overlapping links so that the user can understand them? And the answer is A, overview, and B, one at a time. So in this version, Xanadu Space, you're able to go one at a time through the successive links and transclusions. Here, for example, in the left-hand page, we see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and that is quoted from, i.e. transcluded from. You see, we don't quote without maintaining the connection to the original. That's transcluded from King James Bible. This, this page stands in for the whole Bible. And we can step back and make this the current page again and step down to the next. Adam and Lilith immediately began to fight. And of course, Lilith became, came before Eve, as some of you know. And uh, she would not cooperate horizontally, and so she flew away. And that's from something else. And so these are the, the various, <clears throat> I'll pull back and we'll see how various of the different page, of the successive pages fly up, swarf up, if you will, swoop and morph to, uh, to accompany the current connection. So that's what Xanadu Space does. It is, in fact, a complete system in that the code actually brings in the different pieces from different places, working from an edit decision list. In Xanadu, you don't have a URL, you have an EDL, or edit decision list, meaning that a list of the pieces that are to be composited and a list of the overlays which are to go with them. They asked me, how do you avoid breaking links? The answer is, it's a meta issue. You stabilize the addresses of the content. And of course, that's something that the web does not deal with. You see, the World Wide Web is based entirely upon tradition. This thing that, they, that people think is so radical is entirely a computer tradition. You have exposed hierarchical directories the so-called document is in a lump file with a short name. That means you can only have <coughs> links pointing out because the links are inside the document. You have embedded markup, which as far as I'm concerned is a one-way ticket to hell. And <coughs> uh, so there you get the, the web. In fact, you could say that the, the URL determines the World Wide Web and the EDL determines Xanadu. But that's, uh, that's metaphysics we need not get into. Okay, guys, that's it. What you see is 
50 years work up on the screen, and I hope that 51 or 52 will do it, and we'll be able to deploy this into, into a serious literary form. Thank you very much. Please remain standing. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> OK, we can now have some uh, schmoozing break, and then we can return and do Q&A and all that sort of thing. Oh, my god, that was faster than. Did you like a schmoozing break and then Q&A? Wasn't that the plan? Whatever you like. Whatever anybody likes. I can stay here, and I can go all night. Okay, I don't see anybody. Those who want to schmooze, those who want to eat, go eat. Those who want to stay, stay. Not right now. Yeah, sure. Questions, comments, challenges. Hi. The acoustics in here are really terrible, and I cannot hear you. They fixed it from here, but not for the people not here, not at the stage. I, I'm just curious about, uh, for historical purposes. About when, what? For historical, is history, mm -hmm. or not history, or whatever. The, um, there was a Belgium guy called Paul Otley. Otley, yes. Yeah. When, when is the first time you saw his drawing? Because he disappeared from history. I first heard of Otley when it was in the Times a couple of years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And obviously he did fabulous work. It was it was something like the research service of the of the Encyclopedia Britannica. In fact, it's almost as though the Encyclopedia Britannica based their research service on what Otley was offering. Because if you see some of his drawing with the screen and presentation, there's a lot of relationship with your earlier top models. Well, Sorry. information is connected, you know, and yeah. a lot of people know that without being. Yeah. Influenced by one another. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, I'd like to know what you would do um, if you could do anything with a million digitized books. I'd build Xanadu <laughs> and then put them in. You just drop them in. Yeah. The point being that, that you give them stabilized addresses, and now everybody can make their own structures with them and build on them and share those structures. And uh, see, all those things they added to the World Wide Web, wikis, mashups, uh, blogging features, all that is built into Xanadu in the, in, the, in, the, in the condensed minimalistic structure. So instead of special cases which are incompatible, as with the web, it's all there and uh, can be linked, transcluded in any which way. So I think of it as the, as the fundamental generalization of literature. But again, yeah, I don't have any special suggestions for that because I'm focused on one goal only. The copyright issue, however, is, is paramount, and I don't know how to get around that, except my suggestion, which is, the copyright method always suggested by Xanadu, which is that copyrighted material be available for purchase at a very small amount per byte. Essentially, every reader has a table showing what part of a document he or she has already purchased. And if you happen to purchase another sentence from that document in some other context, nevertheless, that then becomes your permanent possession, and you may always refer to it again so that you may incrementally acquire documents. And this is vital because think of the way, for example, that educated people actually learn things from anthologies, uh, <clears throat> from quotations. And we would like to be able to follow from an anthological piece, from, a, from, a, from an excerpt to the original, and we can't. So the anthology develops a sort of a lifeless 
nature of its own. And being able to follow it back to the original, that changes the whole thing. I'm blithering, but there you are. Uh, if I can ask another question. Uh, so part of the reason we're all here tonight is because of what, you've, what you have accomplished, even if you don't think it's that significant, we do. I, um, I'm sorry, slowly, please. Yeah, so I think part of the reason we're here tonight is because of what you have accomplished. Thank and you. we think it's significant, even if you may not. Um, so with that, I do want to ask, why is it so hard to change the world? <laughs> uh, let's put it this way. There is a, uh, you, can, you can think of it as an abstract curve, like a uh, half-life, that at any time, certain changes in the, in the world might be easy to do, and other changes hard. So it's not that it's generically hard to change the world, it's finding the changes in the world that might happen. And um, it's anybody's guess, always. Thanks. Uh, the other part of it is that, that people tell me, uh, sorry, Ted, the train's already left. Uh, it's too late for your design. I don't think so. I think that uh, the, uh, the strain and pain everyone feels trying to shoehorn their stuff into HTML when what they really want is what I'm offering uh, means that a lot of people will want it right away. Um, question? Ted? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so looking back over Let somebody the else do the choosing because I can't see you at all. How about the person with the microphone? Okay. <laughs> So looking back over 50 years, what surprised you? Is that you Kathleen? Wrote... Yeah, it's Kathleen. Yeah. So what surprised you as you wrote your story? Or... Well, nothing surprised me as I wrote my story. I already knew how it came out. No. <laughs> so there was no introspection in looking over 50 years? Or Excuse what didn't make me. the book? No introspection. Well, no, what surprised you? Looking back over 50 years, well, I've what been came I've been introspecting every minute of that time. I mean, it's not like a, a lot had, a, 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 there were some su sudden surprises I was writing it down. Okay, so let me ask it an inverse way. What didn't make the book? Oh, well, I, basically, I wrote this book by cutting. You may think 380 pages is long, but it would have been a hell of a lot longer if I'd uh, inflicted on the reader everything that I re wrote originally. Um, I, what I finally narrowed it down to was my computer ideas and everything that led up to them or could be vaguely related to what led up to them. And um, so all kinds of amusing anecdotes like uh, uh, driving anecdotes, for example, and, and, uh, and, and strange stories that have nothing to do with my computer life didn't make it. The, uh, what surprised me most in the last 50 years was how long it took, how long things took and how hard it is for most people to imagine new things. I, w I said in the 1960s, soon we'll read and write on computer screens, and they'll, we'll interact with that, and you'll be able to call up from millions of documents, and you'll be able to add your own, and you'll be able to quote anything, and there'll be a uh, connection from every quotation to its original context, and every author will get a royalty because that'll be automatic on every portion that's called up. And in the 60s, they would look at me first. In the early 60s, they would look, just look at me blankly. And in the late 60s, they would say, is it like a tape? <laughs> and I couldn't deal with that. I should have just said yes. <laughs> then um, when the IBM, the Altair came out in 1974, and people said, oh, that's what you meant, Ted. And I said, that's part of it. And then the uh, IBM PC came out in, what was it? 82? 84 was the Mac. 82, I think, was the PC. And, um, and people said, oh, that's what you meant, Ted. I said, that's part of it. 84, the Macintosh. Oh, that's what you meant. That's part of it. 86 or so, HyperCard. Oh, that's what you meant, Ted. That's part of it. Uh, and then bulletin boards in the late 80s. That's what you meant, Ted. That's part of it. Then the World Wide Web comes up. That's what you meant, Ted. No, that is not it. So how did the photographer Arnold Genta save your grandmother? <laughs> this is a plant I have in the audience. 
thank you, Marlene, dearest. <clears throat> uh, I don't have the slightest idea why my grandmother, she was not my grandmother at the time, meaning she was not married, and um, why she was going to Europe on the eve of World War I, except that I guess she thought she was going to do portraits. Well, she, she actually later managed to get the president of France to sit for her twice. In the middle of World War II, he had time, World War I, he had time to sit for her. But uh, that's another story. So she had a ticket on the Lusitania, and she gets a call from Arnold Genta. Now, Arnold Genta was a great photographer. He photographed the San Francisco earthquake. He just happened to be here and have a camera in his pocket. And uh, he had also done the, the only known photographs of the pre-earthquake Chinatown here. And he did other great things like early experiments in color photography using colored rice starch. But anyway, he was a great portrait photographer. He called her up and said, Jean, <clears throat> I understand you're going to Europe, but I want you to meet my friend Ellen Terry. She's sailing on the New York. I'd like to have you change, I'd like to change your tickets to the New York. And my grandmother said, oh no, 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 my, my trunks are already on the Lusitania. He said, I'll arrange everything. So she gets to the New York and makes friends with Ellen Terry, the famous actress, and she is making a drawing of Ellen Terry, which has since been lost. And uh, she says to Ellen Terry, well, I'm so happy to meet you. You know, Arnold Genta had me change ships from the Lusitania just to meet you. And Ellen Terry said, that's strange. He had me change the ships from the Lusitania just to meet you. Is that a friend? Because all the Germans knew it. I mean, it was in my, in my high school text that, that the, um, that the uh, ambassador was at the dock trying to turn people back. Anyway, thank you for that, Marlene. Yeah, I guess. You often hear laments today about... You often hear people lament today about how the internet has made um, our attention span short and gives people, you know, in attention deficit disorder, especially young people, and everybody's knowledge is um, broad but not very deep or it's going in that direction. Do you see that as a trend? And if so, do you think it's a problem? Well, <laughs> I've been a poster child for ADD all my life. And I don't think it's a problem, <laughs> which means that, that I've adapted to it, writing on the back of my hand, carrying notes all the time, etc. And um, essentially, it's a, it's, a, it's, a cognitive adapt it's a cognitive style. And as I said, there sometimes it goes away, obviously, when you really care. I've had moments of extreme emergency in which I was able to concentrate with remarkable perfection, as when cars were spinning around in front of me and so on. And, uh, but it, it can be a problem, but I have, since I don't know a damn thing about the younger generation, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, go so far as to uh, accept what I read in, the, in blog comments, which makes me hope there are smarter ones. <laughs> but I don't know what's going on, do you? <laughs> First, certainly, uh, I favor knowing lots of different things. I think everybody should know much more than they do. And I strive to learn every day. And uh, I wish more people did. But uh, that involves a great deal of a lot of Wikipedia and a lot of uh, radio. And uh, so I favor that. But on the other hand, you do have to be able to concentrate. I'm blithering. I don't have an answer. Yeah. Rob. Would you like to tell us or show us about zigzag? Well, I could. As I said, the, uh, I happen to think I know the true structure of documents and the true structure of structure. Now, why would this be when I'm not a computer scientist? Well, at the end of the book, the climax of the book is where Wendy Hall 
baptizes me a computer scientist, so now I can say I am one. But I've always said that computer scientists are like mandrills following each other's bright tails through the jungle. They, they, they uh, don't have new ideas because they're trying to add a little thing or two to the ideas of the mandrill in front of them. And uh, the reason I find stuff nobody else does is I'm not looking under the street lights. So hyperthogonal structure is simply a generalization of rows and columns. And I'm astounded that no one else has come up with it. I mean, I have a patent which strongly suggests no one else came up with it. And uh, I long conjectured that it would work very well as a data structural system inside big programs. So that instead of creating ad hoc mechanisms for storing different parts of the information you need in a big program, storing them in hyperthogonal structure allows you simply to create and connect new forms of information very quickly without loss of principle. And I don't mean in the, in the, in the financial sense. I mean that it stays principle. So hyperthogonal structure is very simple. Where is this thing? I haven't seen Windows 7 before. I hope I never do again. <laughs> that it? No, that's not it. Is that it? No. Okay, it's in here. Um, ah, yes. Good. All right, here we have, <clears throat> here we have two windows on what looks like an ordinary table. You're looking at the same data in the same two dimensions. We're calling them dimensions one and two. So dimension one is something like horizontal on a page, and dimension two is something like vertical on a page. Or we can, by convention, say it's like that. So we have two cursors. The green cursor, pardon me, the, whoops, oh, I hit the wrong key. OK. <clears throat> we have a blue cursor, which stays in the middle on the right. And I can move it over there, and I don't know why it's jiggling like this. Maybe if I close slocum furlough, that'll help. OK. And the green cursor, which stays in the middle on the left, uh, and wanders around. Now, why do the two windows look different? Because the, the window on the right is the row view, and the window on the left is the stretch vanishing view. Why do you want more than one view? Well, for all sorts of reasons. And I'll show you now. But first, let's look at let's, why, do you, why would we want to depart from a simple table in which <clears throat> you have the same number of rows in every column and the same number of columns in every row? The answer is that data is intrinsically, or as a rule, irregular. And you want to be able to deal with irregularities. So <clears throat> in this system, you're able to create new structure. Uh -huh. You're able to create new structure which goes in all directions. And uh, for example, up there, over there. <clears throat> now, why would you want this? Well, I'll be showing you. But you notice, for example, that these two, that the blue curse, the accursed blue cell and the accursed green cell are connected and were connected before. And when we made these extras, they stayed connected. That's the little curly line. So let's take a concrete example. Let us consider the royal families of Europe. Now, this data was put in by my colleague, Adam Moore. And here we see one possible reason for having two views. The row view on the right emphasizes the regularity of these columns. And the stretch vanishing view on the left allows us to see every character in a cell. So there are different reasons for having, for wanting more than one view. I'm sorry about the, you're getting the, oh, you're not getting the ghastly flicker I am, good. <clears throat> so let's, you see that this main column that both the, that both the cursors are in um, has the names of various royal personages. And over to the side, we have their titles. 
But this other column, for example, I use to connect the different kings of Denmark. So that means I can jump quickly to the different monarchs of Denmark without having to go through the whole of the central column. Ah, you see, there are many structures here that we're still only discovering. But basically, it's just cells connected according to the following rule. The top of every cell can connect to the bottom of any cell. The left side of any cell can connect to the right side of any cell, and so on in as many dimensions as you like, and you can create new dimensions anytime. Now, this gives you both the customary row and column sorts of table and all sorts of things you've never seen before that I can't begin to get into. But let's look at some of the, some of the uses of it. Let's, let's go to the current monarch of the United Kingdom. Here she is, Her Majesty Elizabeth II, Queen of Great, Great, of Great Britain. So on dimension one, we have attached the title. Now, let us pivot in the left hand in the yeah the left hand window to dimension date horizontally dimension three dimension date and we see that Elizabeth was born in 1926. Unlike Edward VIII, for whom we have both a birth and death date, we have only a birth date for Elizabeth because she's still on the throne. Now let us find out more information about Elizabeth by pivoting in the right hand window. Let's go to dimension marriage and see if she's married. Well, we know the answer. But there he is, Philip, uh, Philip Mountbatten, translated from Battenberg. And now let us pivot vertically to dimension children. And there they are, the children of Elizabeth and Philip, Charles, Anne, Andrew, and Edward. Now what happens if we switch to another view, the vanishing view? By Jove, we have a family tree that we can traverse by walking the cursor all around. There's one Victoria. And here is the Victoria we all know. We don't have, uh, <clears throat> anyway, this is, this is, this is uh, so that shows you how we got a family tree, but we didn't create a family tree program. We just put the information into zigzag. So this shows how multiple dimensions, multiple discrete dimensions uh, can do all kinds of things for you. And I won't give you any more of a hard sell than that, except to say, that in Xanadu space, which we saw before, where the heck is it? Nope. Da, 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 da. OK. Now, this is the first program in which ZigZag was actually used as a data mechanism. So instead of creating the various tables and semaphores and dotiotis and cues that are conventional with software of this magnitude and, and complexity. The programmer, Rob Smith, used ZigZag as the interior mechanism and discovered, he confirmed my conjecture that yes, indeed, it made programming a big program simpler. So for example, each of these pages has a ZigZag cluster which states its position and angle each of these links and transclusions similarly, and each subpart of each page. And by using ZigZag as the interior data mechanism, the, the time of programming this thing was cut considerably. Unfortunately, we haven't, uh, we haven't got it finished. We're tr I'm still trying after some years trying to get this thing finished. But at least the parts are all there. So that was zigzag. Hyperthogonal structure is the generic. Please do not use the term Xanadu or zigzag for any imitations. You can call them, if you want to program things like these, please give them names of your own because Xanadu and zig zigzag are trademarks which I maintain at great expense. People are so shy. Yes. Hi there. I have a quick question. Do you, is your uh, book available as a Xanadu space project or document? Uh, would I wish, yes. But I, we don't have the things in the working, as I already said. Oh, OK. Well, I look forward to that day. Yeah.
Um, Ted, before you're done tonight. Roberta. <laughs> good evening. Before you're done tonight, would you please demystify for me the title of your book? Thank you. <clears throat> In order to demystify it, I need to understand what's mystifying, what, what is mysterious. I've not heard the word before. Possiplex. Well, it seems to me it's English. It's a plex of possibilities. Therefore, the net of connections and projected hypothesizable alternative actions one might take, universes one might walk into, and essentially about the possibilities I faced in my life and tried to seize. <laughs> I would add that posiplexia would be the disease of either being, either freezing at having too many possibilities or trying to seize them all, as I tend to do. And the subtitles, Movies, Intellect, Creative Control, My Computer Life, and the Fight for Civilization, are essentially all are topics which permeate the book. That my, my, the fight for civilization being the last chapter, or the next to last. Ah. Hi. Who is it? Hi, Andrew Wood. Singer, hi. My friend since the, the, the mid 60s. I was going to say it's almost 50 years since I first heard you give a talk called No More Teachers, No More Books. <laughs> and that talk led me to meet you and, and know you for a long time now. Um, so it seems to me that part of the problem of changing what we have is um, it's a problem of the customers. So, you know, I, I like to think that it's, it's probably very hard to open a bad bakery in France <laughs> because the customers are all so sophisticated about right. bread. Good point. And um, the problem we have is that the customers are not sophisticated about the computers they use. And so there's nobody to appeal to with a better idea. You think there's any way that sure. might get changed? I have a different model. I would advert to the history of chewing gum in America. You will recall, of course, <clears throat> that at the Alamo, Davy Crockett and a number of others were massacred by a man named Santa Anna. But Santa Anna's life was spared, though almost all the American troops, pardon me, the Texian troops wanted to string him up. But Sam Houston, had a better idea, send him back to negotiate. And so the peace was negotiated in which Texas achieved its liberty. Santa Ana, it is not generally known, went on to another career. He, he moved north, went to New York City, boarded on Staten Island with a photographer named Adams. And he had brought along a supply of cheek clay, which he wanted to make into automobile tires. And um, Adams investigated this possibility. It didn't work for automobile tires, as you would well imagine. But uh, Adams noted that Santa Ana was chewing it. And so he just tried putting some in druggists with little starch, cornstarch on it, and it took off like a rocket. And thus began the chewing gum industry. So that is the connection between the Alamo and the chewing gum industry, which I <laughs> pointed out in my PhD thesis. <laughs> and uh, in the case of, uh, uh, I, I think that some things are like that. When the Altair first came out, uh, Ed Roberts, the founder of the Altair Computer Company, I mean, he saw the possibilities of using the Intel 8008 chip to make a personal computer kit. He figured that he would break even if he sold 70 or 80. He got, 70 or he got 80 orders the first day and thousands thereafter. And the first, as far as anyone knows, the first Altair that was actually built 
was by a hobbyist who came in his camper and built it in the parking lot. And then when it didn't work, came in and made them debug the system. So that is the kind, there you have a latent urge, a latent posiplex that is awaiting the key, the, 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 the magic thingy that will unlatch it. And I think I have that. <laughs> and I think the world, having seen the World Wide Web, having dealt with Microsoft Word and Adobe Acrobat, I think the world is ready, readier for Xanadu than ever. Could you talk a little bit about the way Xanadu would change the way we write, the process of writing? Yeah. Well, I can't tell you what other people will do, but here's what I need. OK. This book was unwritten, meaning I had probably at least 20 times more material than I ended up using. But it was in the same threads. So I had a, a thread for Xanadu, a thread for this, a thread for that, a thread for my grandparents, a thread for my father, yada, yada, yada. And uh, I would pull across those materials which I wanted to and put back the materials I didn't want to, thinking I might someday get around to using it all in some expanded version. But there is no in existing software handling material you either or want to standing by. And because the model used is that every virtual sheet of paper, uh, you have to put it on a virtual sheet of paper. This to me is nuts. Whereas I would rather have flying notes. What is happening? You're going to change your mic battery. Change my mic battery. So Wow, that was fast. OK. So <clears throat> being able to deal with flying notes, I'm, I'm in correspondence with Larry Tesler about this even now. We're arguing about ancient history, and, and, uh, and, he's, say, and, and he's sure he's right. Uh, whereas I talk about, I talk repeatedly in the book about cut and paste, and I consider it the greatest atrocity in the computer field to have been the renaming, the re changing the meaning of cut and paste. My grandmother attended a, letter by, a lecture by one of the Tolstoy, Tolstoy's daughters who talked about how Tolstoy would dictate to two daughters and they would each write down, he would dictate from his previous manuscript, making changes as he went along, and the two daughters would take, make identi identical copies, one set aside for reference, and the other he would cut up and rearrange all over the floor. And uh, eventually, paste it down in the sequence he wanted. But he would take long walks in the woods and call back, don't touch my noodles. And so that became kind of a slogan around our house. And in high school, I discovered the same method without realizing, because I wasn't thinking about Tolstoy at the time. And uh, from then on, I continued to make a carbon copy that I would save, and one copy I would cut up and rearrange, and tape or staple into the, the next sequence of the next draft. And I still do. I still print out what I call a noodle draft and, and rearrange it. And uh, this is hard work. A full noodle of a fairly long paper takes a day. And this, this is a real pain in the neck. And there is no decent tool. We had a prototype, which I'm going to try to resuscitate. Ian Heath and I in England actually created a prototype that did this. You, it'll, it had flying pieces that you could rearrange, which it would then concatenate according to the way you overlap them. And uh, to me, the lack of such a tool for decent cut and paste is barbaric. But it outrages me that they created this thing called the clipboard. OK, it's like a clipboard in every respect, except you can't see it. It only holds one item. The next item you put on it destroys the previous contents. Now, in every other way, it's like a physical clipboard, but there aren't any other respects, OK? <laughs> so what the word clipboard is doing for you is providing a cognitive excuse for an abominable tool. And this is called a metaphor. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, the, the Apple people seem to have come under the spell of a guy named Lakoff in Berkeley who seems to think, well, I won't get into the strangeness of his views. But <clears throat> I, don't, I, I don't believe in metaphors. I believe in the construction of virtualities, a conceptual structure, that, of, of, of construct logic that has clean structure and minimalist structure. But in any case, the so-called clipboard, I consider the greatest abomin abomination, single abomination of the computer field because the propagandistic redefinition of those words from true cut and paste of the Tolstoy kind to mean hide and plug, which is its current meaning, is the propagandistic use of words to excuse something which is inexcusable. And not having a decent rearrangement method, visible rearrangement method, instead of having to move each piece, and if the phone rings, you lose it, this is still inexcusable, and every system has imitated it. So that's, uh, how did I get here? <laughs> Chet, question. Assuming I love your book, and I want to recommend it to everybody in my social graph, where can they buy it other than coming Lulu. to events com. like this? You can download it at lulu.com, and we hope soon on the Apple Store for, uh, for iPad and, and iPhone and stuff. But lulu.com has it today. We will be taking it to Amazon, et cetera. Now, I should explain this. We get 12 bucks a copy kickback from a paper sale. And if, we go, if it's made available on Amazon, we get three. So that means you have to sell four times as many books just to break the, as even as you would have. You, you see what I'm saying. And uh, it's, a, it's a painful decision, but obviously it's the right one. So we'll be doing that. But uh, one thing at a time, I finished this last week. The version you buy downstairs is, the, is, is ver, draft 20Z, <laughs> and the version that's presently up is draft, I believe, 28S. So there are a few minute differences, but otherwise, it's, 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 if you want the autograph, get the one downstairs. Hi. Yes. Ted, Ted Selker. Um, so Ted Selker, hi. Yeah, hi. Um, so, you know, there's been versioning systems. Uh, there have been some beautiful things, Pettit and P-Edit at, at IBM, where you, know, you, you could, you know, re-edit things, a little bit like the clipboard, except the difference is that you could have, you know, a version that worked on, you know, one operating system and a version that worked on the other, and if you edited some part of it, it edited in both of the versions. Kind of has some of the, the, the things that Wait I Wait a minute, you're telling me this is a feature that it works in two operating systems? Well, maybe you'd have a version that has all of the code that that, uh, that makes something compiled Oh, you're talking about for, for programming? Yeah, but this also yeah. was used by many people for writing papers. And I, I thought it was such an exciting idea, this idea of having, being able to edit and go back, you know, infinitely through the edits you've made and, and maybe even have a couple of versions. And I just wonder what you think of versioning systems and whether you've gotten to work with such an editor before. Well, <clears throat> I thought of versioning in 1960, okay? And Everything I've seen seems to me has seemed to me hopelessly bureaucratic and stupid, but uh, I mean CVS is the only one I can think of, and I haven't really looked at them. So I will grant, for the sake of this discussion, that what you've what you've seen is wonderful and beautiful and perfect, but I don't know anything about it. <coughs> and uh, I continue to want to do my own. Now the the system I finally designed is called HyperTime, and that allows allows you to go forward and backward in version and sideways as well which means that you can go to an intermediate version and branch sideways without losing either the forward or backward directions. This means that every micro version has not just a numerical designation, but some alphanumerics in there too. Every time you branch sideways, it's an alpha and uh, alphanumeric, so that, so that version uh, 17 means after 17 editorial changes, but version 16A3 doesn't obsolete version 17 because it went sideways from version 16. So um, in fact, this is very simple. It was beautifully implemented by Kenichi Unai back in 1996. And so that, too, is a part of an optional part of Xanadu, meaning that it is a designed addition to the edit decision list, which is not required. But that's, that's, that's my position on it. Hello?
Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, team size working on uh, Xanadu? Or, you know, team something. Size. Yeah, like how many people, uh, like, you know, how, how long they've been working on it. Well, let's like put it this or, way. About 100 people in the last 50 years. Uh, presently active, I would say three. But it's not clear. I'm always trying to persuade people. Now, I work only on handshake deals with programmers. My position on backers, you will read in the book. <clears throat> How were Apple and Microsoft and Google able to carry out the vision of their founders? They had no backers. When I mentioned this two nights ago uh, in the audience, I pointed out, yes, Apple had Mike Markula as a backer, but he was a silent backer and let them have their head. And Wozniak in the audience nodded heavily. So the point is that the only way you can fulfill a vision is without backers. And that is why I am penurious, because I believe in the vision more than I believe in being <coughs> in, in comfort. Now, uh, that is why the title is Movies, Intellect, Computer Con uh, Pr Creative Control, and My Computer Life. So what was the question? That, I think you answered it. You said there's three people currently working on it. I was just wondering well, approximately there's, there's a, there's what it takes cloud, to There's a cloud of us. persons who may or may not chime in. And, and so uh, we, we've just nailed down the next two designs. It looks like we're gonna, we have one design in Flash, and we may resuscitate Xanadu Space, which you see before you. The Xanadu Space has many levels. It's, it's written in C++, Python, uh, uh, OpenGL and Zoggle, which is the um, zigzag OpenGL layer. So it's, it's got uh, a number, it's anatomically more complex, whereas the, the Flash version will be client server and, and probably will do better for the sale model I've told you about. Which, by the way, everybody thinks how wonderful it is that the web gives everything away free. Now, I don't say that. I've said from the beginning, because I, the people I knew, I knew people who lived on copyrights. I had my own copyright certificates at the age of 19. I believe in copyright. And what do we have now? A hollowed out publishing world that is falling to pieces because everything had to be given away. The, this has got to be stopped. The point is, it's not that I, want the, I don't want people to give things away, but I want, want, don't want people to be forced to give things away. If you look at the newyorker.com, they, they keep things under glass. And so the notion of Xanadu is flying content under glass that can be reworked, republished, linked, and transcluded. And so that is that, and sold, so that we can once again begin to reconstitute a publishing industry that can survive, that is not merely behemoths uh, like Disney and Bertelsmann. Amen. Thank you. Um, Hallelujah. Just as a uh, somewhat of a, a response, uh, the Internet Archive is going to host a code sprint to try to build uh, ZigZag or an implementation of ZigZag uh, from October 25th to November 24th. There are three people, three programmers that are going to uh, work on it in a support group uh, here at the uh, at the Internet Archive, and we're looking for others, uh, compatible, passionate competent souls. So if you're interested, uh, please let me know. And I can send you the specs. Very detailed. Hi, Ted. Roger. Hi, Ted. Uh, Roger Wagner. I, in the examples you give, they are text-based. And could you comment just on how that extends to, to yep. media? Yeah, the Xanadu model <coughs> extends directly, ideally with no code change. <coughs> to audio samples and video frames. Because, so it's, it essentially is a, <coughs> the, the edit decision list says which pieces to assemble. And the overlay decision list, with, which may or may not be separate, tells you what to overlay it with. And you can overlay it with other content and connect it with other content. Now this is, uh, the edit decision list can apply to video, as it does in Hollywood. The term edit decision list is a Hollywood term, and can be used, it can be used directly for making movies later. 
because the first one we're working on is text. Getting text working is central, and then the rest can come. So it's a, it's a question of the pragmatics of when we implement what. If we make text work, fine. If we don't make text work, there's hardly any point in going on. Scott Mace, um, the use case you mentioned for uh, saving the publishing industry, do you see that as the most compelling use case for Xanadu? What do you mean use case? Well, I mean the justification for adopting No, not Xanadu. at all. It can be perfectly well used by people with, with free content. So the point is that you should be able to link and transclude free and non-free material promiscuously. And, by, and, and there should not be a wall between publishers who charge for material and publishers who don't. So, if you, so you should be able to quote, the whole point of designing it this way at the beginning was so that sold content could be intermixed without worry. Any publishers who opt into this system are granting permission for their content to be used in any new context, provided it's by transclusion, provided that, the, that, that, that each downloader pay for the content, pay for what sliver of content may be quoted. And the objective is not to salvage publishing per se, it is to create a level playing field of universal interquotability and in the universal interconnectability. That was always the idea. And it was to fight for this idea, ideal against many things that I've, that I've, uh, I've taken my stance. Yeah. Hi, Ted. Rob. But let me just add a quotation relevant to this. <clears throat> Horse thieves are hanged, not in order that men should be hanged, but that horses shall not be stolen. I forget who said that. And similarly, I favor charging for content, not because I want all content to be charged for, but because I want a universal playing field where you can mix charged and uncharged content. Thanks. Yes, Rob. So, um, just a clarification. In your pricing model for for non-free uh, content, yeah. does that mean that I would pay only for content that I transclude from, or, for example, the the doc the source documents for that uh, strip of of text up there? are all visible to me. Whatever you download into your browser, let us call it a browser. Prefer to call it something else like a wowser, I don't know. <coughs> because, but by the way, Xanadu is just not compatible with the web browser, period. So we have to start over. OK, whatever, is download, whatever content is downloaded, you pay for it. If you want it to be blank, you don't download it, you don't pay for it. OK. But so next time you download it, you don't pay for it. So. In, in this case, if you have an entire document in the background, you paid for the whole document. Yeah, but, but, but I'm showing it here as a demonstration. A you wouldn't necessarily have done that. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's, it's meant to be very simple. What, what you download, you pay for, but once it's paid for, it's yours forever. And meaning every time you want it, it comes back. That, is, that's, that has been the model basically since 1960. And, and I think it's, it's clean. Uh, it, there's a quote from uh, my old friend Paul Brest. He did my music homework for me when I was a senior in college, but then he went on into law and became dean of Stanford Law School. And uh, when I explained the system, he said, yeah, that works. It all adds up. Now, can't get, high, can't get better than that. <laughs> Hi, Ted. Uh, Sean Murphy of noosphere.org. Wave your oh. hand. I don't see where you. Hello. Oh. <laughs> not, not that there's eye contact. Okay, go ahead. Hello there. Yes, exactly. Our eyes are too small. Um, <laughs> uh, how would you respond to the proposition that, uh, that, uh, to the critique rather that? Um, that what? How would you respond to the critique that hypertext being merely a serialization of the graph structures in our minds? Um, is a uh, is 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 a less desirable, less uh, flexible approach to uh, cognitive collaboration than um, than working directly with, say, a knowledge representation system as 
the repository for, uh, for that externalized graph structure? That is a 17-piece question. Hypertext is a serialization of the graph structure in our mind. This, is, is this to you is the serialization? Yes, each, uh, yes, each, uh, each little fragment of text is, is indeed a serialization, as opposed to being a discrete, a discrete concept. Okay. Like, wh wh where, where is the concept in And this paragraph? to you is not a knowledge representation system? Pardon me? This to you is not a knowledge representation system? It's, 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 a, it's a kind of soup, a wonderful soup, uh, and, uh, and an amusing soup to navigate. But, 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 uh, but if, it's, if instead we actually use uh, a knowledge representation approach, uh, such as what? Say a, a, a frame based knowledge representation approach, for example, where, ah, each, where each assertion AI is. Indeed, indeed. Where, where each assertion is is linked to appropriately other assertions, uh, then uh, then then each assertion is targetable, what was addressable. What was the last? Th then 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 each discrete assertion is addressable. Yeah. Well. And 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 componentized. And most importantly, the machine then is capable of of performing inferencing operations and and assisting us with that aspect of uh, information manip manipulation. Yeah, well, you're on a different planet. <laughs> uh, I point the, uh, <clears throat> when I was once on a, about 1988, I was on a planet, I was on a <laughs> planet, on a, on a uh, podium with uh, Doug Lennett. His first words were, hypertext is evil. Every time I've come up against AI people, it's been, there's been this fundamental difference of point of view. You're talking about inference. I'm talking about presentation to the human mind and creation of presentations to the human mind by other human beings. I'm not interested in AI. I did, however, write an early paper on knowledge representation in 1958, which was conterminous with, with uh, some of the same work at Stanford and MIT, though I didn't know it at the time. It was an extremely sloppy paper, but inspired, discussed in my PhD thesis. No, the, the, uh, I've run into the, the, the conflict with, between AI and, and hypertext has been a cat and dog conflict I've run into uh, over the decades, and I think it will probably never be peaceful. Mm -hmm. uh, by, by using a knowledge re representation approach, it's still, of course, human beings expressing the knowledge, and uh, we, don't, uh, we don't need to, uh, to hand the keys over to the AI. Rather, rather instead, don't think of uh, it as a use of AI at all. Rather rather ask the machine uh, merely to assist us in performing uh, manipulations and operations, inferences uh, and other kinds yeah, of operation on the material. And then, and then it, that provides a, a framework then for, for asking the machine to present the information to us in diverse visualizations Yeah, and you show me a machine that can present, pardon me, I don't want to get. <clears throat> This calls so many arguments to mind, many of which are in the book. Uh, there, 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 there are sections called AI Bullshit 1, AI Bullshit 2, AI Bullshit N. <coughs> um, but I have no objection to use of computers for any good reason. The notion of knowledge representation, the term knowledge representation, however, is an idiotic term. Because, in fact, it throws the whole thing into metaphysics, because knowledge means true belief. And so what we want to do is represent beliefs or assertions, not assert as well that these beliefs and assertions are certainly true. So knowledge representation is essentially the representation of an assertional structure, and that's been done by conventional logic for years and uh, for, for millennia, and now is being done digitally, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, but I doubt that the presentations that are being come up, are coming, that such systems come up with are worth a damn compared with reading and writing. Maybe someday they will be, but uh, I have not created a table of statements 
I've written a book of sentences. And uh, that's where I stand on text versus knowledge representation. Uh, again, uh, these are just friendly responses to a very, very different point of view. Maybe shall we have one more question, then, uh, then break for schmoozing and uh, offline questions? Sure. Or I, I like being up here, if you want to do it. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, Ted, this is Keith Henson. Hi, Keith. Um, as long as people are going to bring up things as esoteric and as far away from, from hypertext as, as the last question, um, I might as well bring up evolutionary psychology Yay. as a way to think about uh, how well things fit with human beings. And of course, we, we evolved in the Stone Age, and that's a long way back. But nonetheless... We evolved long before that. Wait. Oh, well. Anyway, nonetheless, it's, it's, it's a, uh, well, it goes back a million years anyway. But anyway, I'm just wondering if there's any way that you could really apply thinking about what makes people tick at the level of what makes them happy, what makes them useful, how they can think and such stuff, uh, as to where the optimal uh, connection to knowledge would be. And I think hypertext is maybe getting that direction. Well, I think that authors and movie directors through the century, move authors through the centuries and movie directors for the last century have known a lot about this. And I see this as the extension of literature as we know it. And uh, there are no great rules of thumb, except I love Griffith. D.W. Griffith said, make them laugh, make them cry, and make them Wait. <laughs> um, incidentally, in one of the first books that came out on evolutionary psychology, the first popular book, uh, which is by Robert Wright, he has a statement in there that the best evolutionary psychologist uh, in the world prior to evolutionary psychology itself coming along were the authors. Was what? Were authors, particularly of fiction, and he and counted things like you know directors and such stuff, because they had the best feel for the way human beings sure. functioned and, and better than almost anybody else. Human emotions are human emotions, and some people know how to play them, and some people don't. Yeah. I wrote a book on evolutionary psychology, which is condensed, nev never got uh, published, but the a condensed version is in the, on the web under the title, The Secret of Human Life. <clears throat> well, I want to thank you, Ted. Um, and, And, and I gather Ted will be willing to stay here for a while and talk to those that would like to, to, to stay. So, But if there are more snacks, I want to go down there. And then there, there are more snacks? Yeah, right, right. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.